Napoleon, Man of the World by Ralph Waldo Emerson from Representative Men, 1850. Among the eminent persons of the 19th century, Bonaparte is far the best known and the most powerful, and owes his predominance to the fidelity with which he expresses the tone of thought and belief, the aims of the masses of active and cultivated men. It is Swedenborg's theory that every organ is made up of homogeneous particles, or, as it is sometimes expressed, every whole is made of similars. That is, the lungs are composed of infinitely small lungs, the liver of infinitely small livers, the kidney of little kidneys, etc. Following this analogy, if any man is found to carry with him the power and affections of vast numbers, if Napoleon is France, if Napoleon is Europe, it is because the people whom he sways are little Napoleons. In our society, there is a standing antagonism between the conservative and the democratic classes, between those who have made their fortunes and the young and the poor who have fortunes to make, between the interests of dead labor, that is, the labor of hands long ago still in the grave, which labor is now entombed in money stocks, or in land and buildings owned by idle capitalists, and the interests of living labor, which seeks to possess itself of land and buildings and money stocks. The first class is timid, selfish, illiberal, hating innovation and continually losing numbers by death. The second class is selfish also, encroaching, bold, self-relying, always outnumbering the other and recruiting its numbers every hour by burrs. It desires to keep open every avenue to the competition of all and to multiply avenues, the class of businessmen in America, in England, in France, and throughout Europe, the class of industry and skill. Napoleon is its representative, the instinct of active, brave, able men throughout the middle class everywhere has pointed out Napoleon as the incarnate Democrat. He had their virtues and their vices. Above all, he had their spirit or aim. That tendency is material, pointing at a sensual success and employing the richest and most various means to that end. Conversant with mechanical powers, highly intellectual, widely and accurately learned and skillful, but subordinating all intellectual and spiritual forces into means to a material success. To be the rich man is the end. God has granted, says the Quran, to every people a prophet in its own tongue. Paris and London and New York, the spirit of commerce, of money and material power, were also to have their prophet, and Bonaparte was qualified and sent. Every one of the million readers of anecdotes or memoirs or lives of Napoleon delights in the page because he studies in it his own history. Napoleon is thoroughly modern and, at the highest point of his fortunes, has the very spirit of the newspapers. He is no saint, to use his own word, no capuchin, and he is no hero in the high sense. The man in the street finds in him the qualities and powers of other men in the street. He finds him, like himself, by birth a citizen, who, by very intelligible merits, arrived at such a commanding position that he could indulge all those tastes which the common man possesses but is obliged to conceal and deny. Good society, good books, fast traveling, dress, dinners, servants without number, personal weight— the execution of his ideas, the standing and the attitude of a benefactor to all persons about him, the refined enjoyments of pictures, statues, music, palaces, and conventional honors, precisely what is agreeable to the heart of every man in the nineteenth century this powerful man possessed. It is true that a man of Napoleon's truth of adaptation to the mind of the masses around him becomes not merely representative, but actually a monopolizer and usurper of other minds. Thus Mirabeau plagiarized every good thought, every good word that was spoken in France. Dumas relates that he sat in the gallery of the convention and heard Mirabeau make a speech. It struck Dumont that he could fit it with a peroration, which he wrote in pencil immediately, and showed it to Lord Elgin, who sat by him. 
Lord Elgin approved it, and Dumont, in the evening, showed it to Mirabeau. Mirabeau read it, pronounced it admirable, and declared he would incorporate it into his harangue tomorrow to the assembly. It is impossible, said Dumont, as, unfortunately, I have shown it to Lord Elgin. If you have shown it to Lord Elgin and to fifty persons beside, I shall still speak it tomorrow, and he did speak it with much effect at the next day's session. For Mirabeau, with this his overpowering personality, felt that these things which his presence inspired were as much his own as if he had said them, and that his adoption of them gave them their weight. Much more absolute and centralizing was the successor to Mirabeau's popularity, and to much more than his predominance in France. Indeed, a man of Napoleon's stamp almost ceases to have a private speech and opinion. He is so largely receptive and is so placed that he comes to be a bureau for all the intelligence, wit, and power of the age and country. He gains the battle, he makes the code, he makes the system of weights and measures, he levels the Alps, he builds the road, all distinguished engineers, savants, statists, report to him. So likewise do all good heads in every kind. He adopts the best measures, sets his stamp on them, and not these alone, but on every happy and memorable expression, every sentence spoken by Napoleon, and every line of his writing, deserves reading as it is the sense of France. Bonaparte was the idol of common men because he had in transcendent degree the qualities and powers of common men. There is a certain satisfaction in coming down to the lowest ground of politics, for we get rid of cant and hypocrisy. Bonaparte wrought in common with that great class he represented for power and wealth, but Bonaparte specially, without any scruple as to the means, all the sentiments which embarrass men's pursuit of these objects he set aside. The sentiments were for women and children. Fontaine's, in 1804, expressed Napoleon's own sense, when in behalf of the Senate he addressed him, Sire, the desire of perfection is the worst disease that ever afflicted the human mind. The advocates of library and of progress are ideologous. A word of contempt often in his mouth. Necker is an ideologist. Lafayette is an ideologist. An Italian proverb too well known declares that if you would succeed, you must not be too good. It is an advantage within certain limits to have renounced the dominion of the sentiments of piety, gratitude, and generosity, since what was an impassable bar to us, and still is to others, becomes a convenient weapon for our purposes, just as the river, which was a formidable barrier, winter transforms into the smoothest of roads. Napoleon renounced once for all sentiments and affections, and would help himself with his hands and his head. With him is no miracle and no magic. He is a worker in brass, in iron, in wood, in earth, in roads, in buildings, in money, and in troops, and a very consistent and wise master workman. He is never weak and literary, but acts with the solidity and the precision of natural agents. He has not lost his native sense and sympathy with things. Men give way before such a man as before natural events. To be sure, there are men enough who are immersed in things, as farmers, smiths, sailors, and mechanics generally, and we know how real and solid such men appear in the presence of scholars and grammarians, but these men ordinarily lack the power of arrangement, and are like hands without a head. But Bonaparte superadded to this mineral and animal force insight and generalization, so that men saw in him combined the natural and the intellectual power, as if the sea and land had taken flesh and begun to cipher. Therefore the land and sea seemed to presuppose him. He came unto his own, and they received him. This ciphering operative knows what he is working with, and what is the product. He knew the properties of gold and iron, of wheels and ships, of troops and diplomatists, diplomatists and required that each should do after its kind. The art of war was the game in which he exerted his arithmetic. It consisted, according to him, in having always more forces than the enemy, on the point where the enemy is attacked, or where he attacks, and his whole talent is strained by endless maneuver and evolution, to march always on the enemy at an angle, and destroy his forces in detail. It is obvious that a very small force, 
skillfully and rapidly maneuvering so as always to bring two men against one at the point of engagement will be an overmatch for a much larger body of men the times his constitution and his early circumstances combined to develop this pattern democrat he had the virtues of his class and the conditions for their activity that common sense which no sooner respects any end than it finds the means to effect it the delight in the use of means in the choice simplification and combining of means the directness and thoroughness of his work the prudence with which all was seen and the energy with which all was done make him the natural organ and head of what i may almost call from its extent the modern party nature must have far the greatest share in every success and so in his such a man was wanted and such a man was born a man of stone and iron capable of sitting on horseback sixteen or seventeen hours of going many days together without rest or food except by snatches and with the speed and spring of a tiger in action a man not embarrassed by any scruples compact instant selfish prudent and of a perception which did not suffer itself to be balked or misled by any pretences of others or any superstition or any heat or haste of his own my hand of iron he said was not at the extremity of my arm it was immediately connected with my head he respected the power of nature and fortune and ascribed to it his superiority instead of valuing himself like inferior men on his opinionativeness and waging war with nature his favorite rhetoric lay in allusion to his star and he pleased himself as well as the people when he styled himself the child of destiny they charge me he said with the commission of great crimes men of my stamp do not commit crimes nothing has been more simple than my elevation tis in vain to ascribe it to intrigue or crime it was owing to the peculiarity of the times and to my reputation of having fought well against the enemies of my country i have always marched with the opinion of great masses and with events of what use then would crimes be to me again he said speaking of his son my son cannot replace me i could not replace myself i am the creature of circumstances he had a directness of action never before combined with so much comprehension he is a realist terrific to all talkers and confused truth obscuring persons he sees where the matter hinges throws himself on the precise point of resistance and slights all other considerations he is strong in the right manner namely by insight he never blundered into victory but won his battles in his head before he won them on the field his principal means are in himself he asks counsel of no other in seventeen ninety six he writes to the directory i have conducted the campaign without consulting any one i should have done no good if i had been under the necessity of conforming to the notions of another person i have gained some advantages over superior forces and when totally destitute of everything because in the persuasion that your confidence was reposed in me my actions were as prompt as my thoughts history is full down to this day of the imbecility of kings and governors there are a class of persons much to be pitied for they know not what they should do the weavers strike for bread and the king and his ministers knowing not what to do meet them with bayonets but napoleon understood his business here was a man who in each moment and emergency knew what to do next it is an immense comfort and refreshment to the spirits not only of kings but of citizens few men have any next they live from hand to mouth without plan and are ever at the end of their line and after each action wait for an impulse from abroad napoleon had been the first man of the world if his ends had been purely public as he is he inspires confidence and vigor by the extraordinary unity of his action he is firm sure self-denying self-postponing sacrificing everything money troops generals and his own safety also to his aim not misled like common adventurers by the splendor of his own means incidents ought not to govern policy he said but policy incidents to be hurried away by every event is to have no political system at all 
His victories were only so many doors, and he never for a moment lost sight of his way onward in the dazzle and uproar of the present circumstance. He knew what to do, he, and he flew to his mark. He would shorten a straight line to come at his object. Horrible anecdotes may no doubt be collected from his history of the price at which he bought his successes, but he must not therefore be set down as cruel, but only as one who knew no impediment to his will, not bloodthirsty, not cruel, but woe to what thing or person stood in his way, not bloodthirsty, but not sparing of blood and pitiless. He saw only the object. The obstacle must give way. Sire, General Clark cannot combine with General Junot for the dreadful fire of the Austrian battery. Let him carry the battery. Sire, every regiment that approaches the heavy artillery is sacrificed. Sire, what orders? Forward, forward. Serousier, a colonel of artillery, gives, in his military memoirs, the following sketch of a scene after the Battle of Austerlitz. At the moment in which the Russian army was making its retreat, painfully but in good order, on the ice of the lake, the Emperor Napoleon came riding at full speed toward the artillery. "'You are losing time,' he cried. "'Fire upon those masses. They must be in golf. Fire upon the ice!' The order remained unexecuted for ten minutes. In vain, several officers and myself were placed on the slope of a hill to produce the effect. Their balls and mine rolled upon the ice without breaking it up. Seeing that, I tried a simple method of elevating light howitzers. The almost per perpendicular fall of the heavy projectiles produced the desired effect. My method was immediately followed by the adjoining batteries, and in less than no time we buried some thousands of Russians and Austrians under the waters of the lake. In the plenitude of his resources, every obstacle seemed to vanish. There shall be no Alps, he said, and he built his perfect roads, climbing by graded galleries their steepest precipices, until Italy was as open to Paris as any town in France. He laid his bones to and wrought for his crown. Having decided what was to be done, he did that with might and main. He put out all his strength. He risked everything and spared nothing, neither ammunition, nor money, nor troops, nor generals, nor himself. We like to see everything do its office after its kind, whether it be a milk cow or a rattlesnake, and if fighting be the best mode of adjusting national differences, as large majorities of men seem to agree, certainly Bonaparte was right in making it thorough. The grand principle of war, he said, was that an army ought always to be ready, by day and by night, and at all hours, to make all the resistance it is capable of making. He never economized his ammunition, but, on a hostile position, rained a torrent of iron, shells, balls, grape-shot, to annihilate all defense. On any point of resistance, he concentrated squadron on squadron in overwhelming numbers until it was swept out of existence. To a regiment of horse chasseurs at Lobenstein, two days before the Battle of Jena, Napoleon said, my lads, you must not fear death. When soldiers brave death, they drive him into the enemy's ranks. In the fury of assault, he no more spared himself. He went to the edge of his possibility. It is plain that in Italy he did what he could and all that he could. He came several times within an inch of ruin, and his own person was all but lost. He was flung into the marsh at Arcola. The Austrians were between him and his troops in the Malay, and he was brought off with desperate efforts. At Lanado and at other places he was on the point of being taken prisoner. He fought sixty battles. He had never enough. Each victory was a new weapon. My power would fall were I not to support it by new achievements. Conquest has made me what I am, and conquest must maintain me. He felt with every wise man that as much life is needed for conservation as for creation. We are always in peril, always in a bad plight, just on the edge of destruction, and only to be saved by invention and courage. This vigor was guarded and tempered by the coldest prudence and punctuality. A thunderbolt in the attack, he was found invulnerable in his entrenchments. His very attack was never the inspiration of courage, but the result of calculation. His idea of the best defense consists in being still the attacking party. My ambition, he says, was great, but was of a cold nature. In one of his conversations with Las Casas, 
he remarked as to moral courage i have rarely met with the two o'clock in the morning kind i mean unprepared courage that which is necessary on an unexpected occasion and which in spite of the most unforeseen events leaves full freedom of judgment and decision and he did not hesitate to declare that he was himself eminently endowed with this two o'clock in the morning courage and that he had met with few persons equal to himself in this respect everything depended on the nicety of his combinations and the stars were not more punctual than his arithmetic his personal attention descended to the smallest particulars at montebello i ordered kellerman to attack with eight hundred horse and with these he separated the six thousand hungarian grenadiers before the very eyes of the austrian cavalry this cavalry was half a league off and required a quarter of an hour to arrive on the field of action and i have observed that it is always these quarters of an hour that decide the fate of a battle before he fought a battle bonaparte thought little about what he should do in case of success but a great deal about what he should do in case of a reverse of fortune the same prudence and good sense mark all his behavior his instructions to his secretary at the tuileries are worth remembering during the night enter my chamber as seldom as possible do not awake me when you have any good news to communicate with that there is no hurry but when you bring bad news rouse me instantly for then there is not a moment to be lost it was a whimsical economy of the same kind which dictated his practice when general in italy in regard to his burdensome correspondence he directed bourrienne to leave all letters unopened for three weeks and then observed with satisfaction how large a part of the correspondence had thus disposed of itself and no longer required an answer his achievement of business was immense and enlarges the known powers of man there have been many working kings from ulysses to william of orange but none who accomplished a tithe of this man's performance to these gifts of nature napoleon added the advantage of having been born to a private and humble fortune in his later days he had the weakness of wishing to add to his crowns and badges the prescription of aristocracy but he knew his debt to his austere education and made no secret of his contempt for the born kings and for the hereditary asses as he coarsely styled the bourbons he said that in their exile they had learned nothing and forgot nothing bonaparte had passed through all the degrees of military service but also was citizen before he was emperor and so has the key to citizenship his remarks and estimates discover the information and justness of measurement of the middle class those who had to deal with him found that he was not to be imposed upon but could cipher as well as another man this appears in all parts of his memoirs dictated at st helena when the expenses of the empress of his household of his palaces had accumulated great debts napoleon examined the bills of the creditors himself detected overcharges and errors and reduced the claims by considerable sums his grand weapon namely the millions whom he directed he owed to the representative character which clothed him he interests us as he stands for france and for europe and he exists as captain and king only as far as the revolution or the interest of the industrious masses found an organ and a leader in him in the social interests he knew the meaning and value of labor and threw himself naturally on that side i like an incident mentioned by one of his biographers at st helena when walking with mrs balcom some servants carrying heavy boxes passed by on the road and mrs balcom desired them in rather an angry tone to keep back napoleon interfered saying respect the burden madam in the time of the empire he directed attention to the improvement and embellishment of the markets of the capital the marketplace he said is the louvre of the common people the principal works that have survived him are his magnificent roads he filled the troops with his spirit and a sort of freedom and companionship grew up between him and them which the forms of his court never permitted between the officers and himself they performed under his eye that which no others could do the best document of his relation to his troops is the order of the day on the morning of the battle of austerlitz in which napoleon promises the troops that he will keep his person out of reach of fire 
this declaration which is the reverse of that ordinarily made by generals and sovereigns on the eve of a battle sufficiently explains the devotion of the army to their leader but though there is in particulars this identity between napoleon and the mass of the people his real strength lay in their conviction that he was their representative in his genius and aims not only when he courted but when he controlled and even when he decimated them by his conscriptions he knew as well as any jacobin in france how to philosophize on liberty and equality and when allusion was made to the precious blood of centuries which was spilled by the killing of the duke dungeon he suggested neither is my blood ditchwater the people felt that no longer the throne was occupied and the land sucked of its nourishment by a small class of legitimates secluded from all community with the children of the soil and holding the ideas and superstitions of a long-forgotten state of society instead of that vampire a man of themselves held in the tuileries knowledge and ideas like their own opening of course to them and their children all places of power and trust the day of sleepy selfish policy ever narrowing the means and opportunities of young men was ended and a day of expansion and demand was come a market for all the powers and productions of man was opened brilliant prizes glittered in the eyes of youth and talent the old iron-bound feudal france was changed into a young ohio or new york and those who smarted under the immediate rigors of the new monarch pardoned them as the necessary severities of the military system which had driven out the oppressor and even when the majority of the people had begun to ask whether they had really gained anything under the exhausting levies of men and money of the new master the whole talent of the country in every rank and kindred took his part and defended him as its natural patron in eighteen fourteen when advised to rely on the higher classes napoleon said to those around him gentlemen in the situation in which i stand my only nobility is the rabble of the faubourgs napoleon met this natural expectation the necessity of his position required a hospitality to every sort of talent and its appointment to trusts and his feeling went along with this policy like every superior person he undoubtedly felt a desire for men and compeers and a wish to measure his power with other masters and an impatience of fools and underlings in italy he sought for men and found none good god he said how rare men are there are eighteen millions in italy and i have with difficulty found two dandolo and melzi in later years with larger experience his respect for mankind was not increased in a moment of bitterness he said to one of his oldest friends men deserve the contempt with which they inspire me i have only to put some gold lace on the coat of my virtuous republicans and they immediately become just what i wish them this impatience at levity was however an oblique tribute of respect to those able persons who commanded his regard not only when he found them friends and coadjutors but also when they resisted his will he could not confound fox and pitt carnot lafayette and bernadot with the danglers of his court and in spite of the detraction which his systematic egotism dictated toward the great captains who conquered with and for him ample acknowledgments are made by him to lanet durot clebert disset Massena, Murat, Ney, and Augereau, if he felt himself their patron and the founder of their fortunes, as when he said, I made my generals out of mud, he could not hide his satisfaction in receiving from them a second dean and support commensurate with the grandeur of his enterprise. In the Russian campaign, he was so much impressed by the courage and resources of Marshal Ney that he said, I have two hundred millions in my coffers, and I would give them all for Ney. The characters which he has drawn of several of his marshals are discriminating, and though they did not content, the insatiable vanity of French officers are no doubt substantially just. And in fact, every species of merit was sought and advanced under his government i know he said the depth and draught of water of every one of my generals natural power was sure to be well received at his court seventeen men in his time were raised from common soldiers to the rank of king marshal duke or general 
and the crosses of his legion of honor were given to personal valor and not to family connection when soldiers have been baptized in the fire of the battlefield they have all one rank in my eyes when a natural king becomes a titular king everybody is pleased and satisfied the revolution entitled the strong populace of the faubourg saint antoine and every horse-boy and powder monkey in the army to look on napoleon as flesh of his flesh and the creature of his party but there is something in the success of grand talent which enlists an universal sympathy for in the prevalence of sense and spirit over stupidity and malversation all reasonable men have an interest and as intellectual beings we feel the air purified by the electric shock when material force is overthrown by intellectual energies as soon as we are removed out of the reach of local and accidental partialities man feels that napoleon fights for him these are honest victories this strong steam engine does our work whatever appeals to the imagination by transcending the ordinary limits of human ability wonderfully encourages us and liberates us this capacious head revolving and disposing sovereignly trains of affairs and animating such multitudes of agents this eye which looked through europe this prompt invention this inexhaustible resource what events what romantic pictures what strange situations when spying the alps by a sunset in the sicilian sea drawing up his army for battle in sight of the pyramids and saying to his troops from the tops of those pyramids forty centuries look down on you fording the red sea wading in the gulf of the isthmus of suez on the shore of ptolemy gigantic projects agitated him had acre fallen i should have changed the face of the world his army on the night of the battle of austerlitz which was the anniversary of his inauguration as emperor presented him with a bouquet of forty standards taken in the fight perhaps it is a little puerile the pleasure he took in making these contrasts glaring as when he pleased himself with making kings wait in his antechambers at tilsit at paris and at erfurt we cannot in the universal imbecility indecision and indolence of men sufficiently congratulate ourselves on this strong and ready actor who took occasion by the beard and showed us how much may be accomplished by the mere force of such virtues as all men possess in less degrees namely by punctuality by personal attention by courage and thoroughness the austrians he said do not know the value of time i should cite him in his earlier years as a model of prudence his power does not consist in any wild or extravagant force in any enthusiasm like mohammed's or singular power of persuasion but in the exercise of common sense on each emergency instead of abiding by rules and customs the lesson he teaches is that which vigor always teaches that there is always room for it to what heaps of cowardly doubts is not that man's life an answer when he appeared it was the belief of all military men that there could be nothing new in war as it is the belief of men to-day that nothing new can be undertaken in politics or in church or in letters or in trade or in farming or in our social manners and customs and as it is at all times the belief of society that the world is used up but bonaparte knew better than society and moreover knew that he knew better i think all men know better than they do know that the institutions we so volubly commend are go-carts and baubles but they dare not trust their presentiments bonaparte relied on his own sense and did not care a bean for other people's the world treated his novelties just as it treats everybody's novelties made infinite objection mustered all the impediments but he snapped his finger at their objections what creates great difficulty he remarks in the profession of the land commander is the necessity of feeding so many men and animals if he allows himself to be guided by the commission commissaries he will never stir and all his expeditions will fail an example of his common sense is what he says of the passage of the alps in winter which all writers one repeating after the other had described as impracticable the winter says napoleon is not the most unfavorable season for the passage of lofty mountains the snow is then firm the weather settled and there is nothing to fear from 
avalanches the real and only danger to be apprehended in the Alps. On these high mountains there are very often very fine days in December of a dry cold with extreme calmness in the air. Read his account, too, of the way in which battles are gained. In all battles, a moment occurs when the bravest troops, after having made the greatest efforts, feel inclined to run. That terror proceeds from a want of confidence in their own courage, and it only requires a slight opportunity, a pretense, to restore confidence to them. The art is to give rise to the opportunity and to invent the pretense. At Arcola, I won the battle with twenty-five horsemen, I seized that moment of lassitude, gave every man a trumpet, and gained the day with this handful. You see that two armies are two bodies which meet and endeavor to frighten each other. A moment of panic occurs, and that moment must be turned to advantage. When a man has been present in many actions, he distinguishes that moment without difficulty. It is as easy as casting up an addition. This deputy of the 19th century added to his gifts a capacity for speculation on general topics. He delighted in running through the range of practical, of literary, and of abstract questions. His opinion is always original and to the purpose. On the voyage to Egypt, he liked, after dinner, to fix on three or four persons to support a proposition, and as many to oppose it. He gave a subject, and the discussions turned on questions of religion, the different kinds of government, and the art of war. One day he asked whether the planets were inhabited. On another, what was the age of the world? Then he proposed to consider the probability of the destruction of the globe, either by water or by fire. At another time, the truth or fallacy of presentiments and the interpretation of dreams. He was very fond of talking of religion. In 1806, he conversed with Fournier, Bishop of Montpellier, on matters of theology. There were two points on which they could not agree, that of hell and that of salvation out of the pale of the church. The emperor told Josephine that he disputed like a devil on these two points, on which the bishop was inexorable. To the philosophers he readily yielded all that was proved against religion as the work of men and time, but he would not hear of materialism. One fine night, on deck, amid a clatter of materialism, Bonaparte pointed to the stars and said, You may talk as long as you please, gentlemen, but who made all that? He delighted in the conversation of men of science, particularly of Manger and Berthollet, but the men of letters he slighted. They were manufacturers of phrases. Of medicine, too, he was fond of talking, and with those of its practitioners, whom he most esteemed, with Corvissar at Paris, and with Antonomarchi at St. Helena. Believe me, he said to the last, we had better leave off all these remedies. Life is a fortress which neither you nor I know anything about. Why throw obstacles in the way of its defense? Its own means are superior to all the apparatus of your laboratories. Corvissard candidly agreed with me that all your filthy mixtures are good for nothing. Medicine is a collection of uncertain prescriptions, and the results of which, taken collectively, are more fatal than useful to mankind. Water, air, and cleanliness are the chief articles in my pharmacopoeia. His memoirs, dictated to Count Montholon and General Gorga at St. Helena, have great value after all the deduction that it seems is to be made from them. On account of his known disingenuousness, he has the good nature of strength and conscious superiority. I admire his simple, clear narrative of his battles. Good as Caesar's, his good-natured and sufficiently respectful account of Marshal Wormser and his other antagonist, and his own equality as a writer to his varying subject. The most agreeable portion is the campaign in Egypt. He had hours of thought and wisdom, in intervals of leisure, either in the camp or the palace. Napoleon appears as a man of genius, directing on abstract questions, the native appetite for truth, and the impatience of words he was wont to show in war. He could enjoy every play of invention, a romance, a bon mot, as well as a stratagem in a campaign. He delighted to fascinate Josephine and her ladies in a dim-lighted apartment by the terrors of a fiction to which his voice and dramatic power lent every addition. 
I call Napoleon the agent or attorney of the middle class of modern society, of the throng who fill the markets, shops, counting houses, manufactories, ships of the modern world aiming to be rich. He was the agitator, the destroyer of prescription, the internal improver, the liberal, the radical, the inventor of means, the opener of doors and markets, the subverter of monopoly and abuse. Of course the rich and aristocratic did not like him. England, the center of capital, and Rome and Austria, centers of tradition and genealogy, opposed him. The consternation of the dull and conservative classes, the terror of the foolish old men and old women of the Roman conclave, who in their despair took hold of anything and would cling to red-hot iron, the vain attempts of status to amuse and deceive him, of the emperor of Austria to bribe him, and the instinct of the young, ardent, and active men everywhere, which pointed him out as the giant of the middle class, make his history bright and commanding. He had the virtues of the masses of his constituents. He had also their vices. I am sorry that the brilliant picture has its reverse, but that is the fatal quality which we discover in our pursuit of wealth, that it is treacherous and is bought by the breaking or weakening of the sentiments." And it is inevitable that we should find the same fact in the history of this champion who proposed to himself simply a brilliant career, without any stipulation or scruple concerning the means. Bonaparte was singularly destitute of generous sentiments. The highest place individual in the most cultivated age and population of the world, he has not the merit of common truth and honesty. He is unjust to his generals, egotistic and monopolizing, meanly stealing the credit of their great actions from Kellerman, from Bernadotte, intriguing to involve his faithful Junot in hopeless bankruptcy in order to drive him to a distance from Paris, because the familiarity of his manners offends the new pride of his throne. He is a boundless liar. The official paper, his moniteur, and all his bulletins are proverbs for saying what he wished to be believed. And worse, he sat in his premature old age, in his lonely island, coldly falsifying facts and dates and characters, and giving to history a theatrical eclat. Like all Frenchmen, he has a passion for stage effect. Every action that breathes of generosity is poisoned by this calculation. His star, his love of glory, his doctrine of the immortality of the soul, are all French. I must dazzle and astonish. If I were to give the liberty of the press, my power could not last three days. To make a great noise is his favorite design. A great reputation is a great noise. The more there is made, the farther off it is heard. Laws, institutions, monuments, nations, all fall. But the noise continues and resounds in after ages. His doctrine of immortality is simply fame. His theory of influence is not flattering. There are two lovers for moving men, interest and fear. Love is a silly infatuation. Depend upon it. Friendship is but a name. I love nobody. I do not even love my brothers, perhaps Joseph a little from habit, and because he is my elder, and Duroc, I love him too, but why? Because his character pleases me, he is stern and resolute, and I believe the fellow never shed a tear. For my part, I know very well that I have no true friends. As long as I continue to be what I am, I may have as many pretended friends as I please, leave sensibility to women, but men should be firm in heart and purpose, or they should have nothing to do with war and government. He was thoroughly unscrupulous. He would steal, slander, assassinate, drown, and poison as his interest dictated. He had no generosity, but more vulgar hatred. He was intensely selfish. He was perfidious. He cheated at cards. He was a prodigious gossip and opened letters and delighted in his infamous police and rubbed his hands with joy when he had intercepted some morsel of intelligence concerning the men and women about him, boasting that he knew everything and interfered with the cutting the dresses of the women and listened after the hurrahs and the compliments of the street incognito. His manners were coarse. He treated women with low familiarity. He had the habit of pulling their ears and pinching their cheeks when he was in good humor, and of pulling the ears and whiskers of men, and of striking and horseplay with them to his last days. 
it does not appear that he listened at keyholes or at least that he was caught at it in short when you have penetrated through all the circles of power and splendor you were not dealing with a gentleman at last but with an impostor and a rogue, and he fully deserves the epithet of jupiter scapin or a sort of scamp jupiter in describing the two parties into which modern society divides itself the democrat and the conservative i said bonaparte represents the democrat or the party of men of business against the stationary or conservative party i omitted then to say what is material to the statement namely that these two parties differ only as young and old the democrat is a young conservative the conservative is an old democrat the aristocrat is the democrat ripe and gone to seed because both parties stand on the one ground of the supreme value of property which one endeavors to get and the other to keep bonaparte may be said to represent the whole history of this party its youth and its age yes and with poetic justice its fate in his own the counter-revolution the counter-party still waits for its organ and representative in a lover and a man of truly public and universal aims here was an experiment under the most favorable conditions of the powers of intellect without conscience never was such a leader so endowed and so weaponed never leader found such aids and followers and what was the result of this vast talent and power of these immense armies burned cities squandered treasures immolated millions of men of this demoralized europe it came to no result all passed away like the smoke of his artillery and left no trace he left france smaller poorer feebler than he found it and the whole contest for freedom was to be begun again the attempt was in principle suicidal france served him with life and limb and estate as long as it could identify its interest with him but when men saw that after victory was another war after the destruction of armies new conscriptions and they who had toiled so desperately were never nearer to the reward they could not spend what they had earned nor repose on their downbeds nor strut in their chateau they deserted him men found that his absorbing egotism was deadly to all other men it resembled the torpedo which inflicts a succession of shocks on any one who takes hold of it producing spasms which contract the muscles of the hand so that the man cannot open his fingers and the animal inflicts new and more violent shocks until he paralyzes and kills his victim so this exorbitant egotist narrowed impoverished and absorbed the power and existence of those who served him and the universal cry of france and of europe in eighteen fourteen was enough of him assez de bonaparte it was not bonaparte's fault he did all that in him lay to live and thrive without moral principle it was the nature of things the eternal law of man and of the world which balked and ruined him and the result in a million experiments will be the same every experiment by multitudes or by individuals that has a sensual and selfish aim will fail the pacific fourier will be as inefficient as the pernicious napoleon as long as our civilization is essentially one of property of fences of exclusiveness it will be mocked by delusions our riches will leave us sick there will be bitterness in our laughter and our wine will burn in our mouth only that good profits which we can taste with all doors open and which serves all men